We're going to get started now because we have a lot of announcements and uh, um, I know more folks are going to be coming in and uh, uh, welcome, come on in. Uh, good morning to you on this. Uh, this is the sixth Sunday after Pentecost and of course it's also the 4th of July and, and uh, hope you're going to have some good celebrations today and, and enjoy, enjoy the day. A hot day, but not too bad uh, out. Next week, we are planning on doing our service outdoors. Uh, we're going to do it. And I've, I was just looking at the extended forecast, and what they're looking at next week is, is uh, highs of in the upper 70s. So it should be a nice, uh, coolish day to try to do it. We were going to do an outdoor service in June, and we ended up, the, the forecast was for temperatures in the 90s with high humidity, so we kind of decided to do that indoors, but it looks like if we do one next week, the, the weather's going to cooperate. So, so next week at 9.30, we're going to be out on the lawn, and uh, um, you can bring your lawn chairs, and, and uh, we're going to have an outdoor service. We, we're going to hook up some music out there and things like that. If you come and you forgot a, a, a lawn chair, we can bring some chairs up from downstairs. We'll have some available that you can go and get one and... and uh, uh, use one of the church chairs, but uh, if you uh, think about it, bring your lawn chair or bring a blanket. You can sit on the ground. You're welcome to do that. Um, before the rest of the announcements, just some uh, birthdays this week. On Tuesday, July 6th, Dwayne Smith uh, has a birthday. Dwayne must, oh, there he is. He's coming in. So, <laughs> Just as I announce your birthday, he walks in. <laughs> so Dwayne has a birthday on Tuesday. Happy birthday. On Wednesday, July 7th, Jennifer Jaquis has a birthday as well, so happy birthday to Jennifer. Thursday, July 8th, Lindsay Kauser has a birthday. Happy birthday, Lindsay. On Friday, July 9th, is the birthday of Kristen Johnson. And then on Saturday, July 10th, Harlan Olson has his first birthday. So he's going to be one year old, Harlan is, on Saturday, July 10th. We have no anniversaries this week. Yep. Who should I forget? Gay, you got a birthday this week? Tuesday, July 6th, Gay Kyle's birthday. All right. <laughs> so add Gay to our birthday list. Happy birthday, Gay. Um, prayer concerns. Um, uh, we, we were finally, uh, this past Wednesday, able to have a, a, uh, a memorial service for Tommy Larson. He had passed away last October. Um, and uh, we were waiting for all the COVID uh, uh, restrictions to be lifted because all the folks from Gateway wanted to be here and, and his friends there. And we had a, we had a great uh, celebration that I almost missed because my, our flight home from California got canceled and we had to scramble um, to find a new flight. And, and we, got, we got in at 6 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday. We were supposed to get in Tuesday afternoon, got in 6 o'clock in the morning Wednesday. Um, and I was a little frantic about what, what, what was going to happen if we didn't get back, but we did. Uh, my bionic knee was aching when we got in, but after that, uh, and, and it is, it, you know, I, I get the hospital bills now, and I, I do feel like the $6 million man, you know, but <laughs> well, you young people don't even know that reference. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but we had, we had a wonderful, just upbeat remembrance of Tommy's life, and, uh, um, and what a blessing he was to all of us, and and so um, uh, our thoughts and prayers are with Diane and Joanne and all the family and friends as, as we said our goodbyes on Wednesday. Uh, we have the folks that we continue to pray for uh, who are dealing with cancer at various stages uh, along the way. Kim Darrow and Marvin Hartz, Jeanette Dunn, Matt Scruggs, Matt's mother Susan, and Anna Meyer, and a couple of others that uh, um, uh, we name in our hearts, but uh, we're not going to name uh, publicly. And so those are our, cancer, our folks dealing with cancer. Some other issues, uh, as you heard last week when Pastor Norm was here, Lonnie Swinford, uh, she went in for a, uh, a routine procedure to remove some gallstones and had a stroke. And uh, she is still deal dealing with that. She is at uh, St. Francis Hospital in Peoria. I got a chance to visit with her this week. And, and uh, her speech is coming back nicely. We had a really good conversation, but... Still not much movement on that right side and needs a lot of therapy. Um, in a few weeks, she'll be out of the hospital. I don't know where she'll be going after she leaves the hospital, but, but our thoughts and prayers continue to be with Lonnie. 
Also, Pat Anderson, Tom's sister, dealing with her lung issues, her breathing issues, and uh, that's been getting worse lately, so we want to lift her up in our prayers. Linda Bacon has a brother, Ray Chamberlain Jr. Uh, I think he's out in Arizona, I think she said. Um, he's had some complications following a back surgery. Back surgeries can be rough, as those of you who've had them know. And uh, John Purvis, we continue to lift him up in prayer. Kate Newby, and Mary Hull, and Sarah Himes. Uh, Sarah Himes uh, had a stroke back in December and was in uh, you know, rehab for a long time, and she is now home. And so uh, that's great news, and so we want to lift up Sarah in our prayers. Um, I do want to say thank you to Pastor Norm uh, for filling in for me last week when I was in California seeing our new granddaughter. That was a blessing. Um, but Pastor Norm lost his cross while he was here. He has a pewter cross. Probably looks a lot like this. This isn't it, though. <laughs> uh, but he has a cross like this, a pewter cross, that he somewhere mislaid here. So if you're walking uh, through the church sometime and you see a pewter cross, um, that's Pastor Norm. So uh, um, it, it, he would love to, love to get that back. Um, also, Vacation Bible School starts next Sunday, July 11th. We're going to be going Sunday nights, July 11th through the 15th, um, through Thursday the 15th, uh, and that's from 5 to 7.30. It starts with supper every night at 5. We still need some people, uh, and what we need is folks to be crew leaders, and a crew leader is somebody who doesn't have to prepare a lesson or anything like that. Basically, what you have to do is you take a group of young people and you shepherd them around to the different stations. Um, you go to the story time and to the craft time and to the recreation time and various things like that. And you just kind of love on those kids and move them around the building. So it's, there's no preparation really needed for it. Um, yeah, you just need to um, kind of show up and, and uh, be there for the kids each night and uh, make sure they get to the right places and just be there with them. And so if you're, if, you know, if God is speaking to you right now, to your heart, you know, as I say, <laughs> um, please talk to Mary Ann Smith afterwards because we desperately need a couple more people to do that, to be crew leaders. And we, uh, before we begin our worship, we also have uh, our, our mission project for this year's Bible school is going to be um, uh, Edpowerment, which is the education mission that uh, was started by Lonnie Swinford's daughter, Jillian, who is a teacher, and another uh, teacher friend of hers started it. And, and, and they've done some wonderful things over in Tanzania, in Africa, uh, in, in East Africa, and, and uh, they've built schools, and they've done just amazing things. And we got a little three-minute video that talks about Ed Powerman. This is our mission project for Vacation Bible School this year, so take it away, Tracy. My basic philosophy of life is that to whom much is given, much is expected. And within that philosophy, you know, you, I've come to realize that just being born in the United States, much is given. Empowerment is really an organization, it's a foundation that provides educational support to impoverished communities, primarily in developing countries. Um, when I first started, I really had a concept of providing sponsorships for needy high school students to be able to get an education. From there, I met other people and we've really expanded our concept. And now we see ourselves as a model to provide the support that's needed depending on the community in which we're operating. So it is this whole kind of combination of programs that comes together in terms of supporting the educational needs that we find in the communities where we exist. And our first community happens to be in this Moshi Arusha area of Tanzania. <laughs> Education means everything anywhere you are. And certainly it's the leg up even if you're an American or in a developed society. The difference is in Tanzania, it really does mean everything. If you have education, 
it's uh, something is permanent. Maybe if you have a, a cab driver, what's happening if your cab get accident? It's okay, sometimes lost your cab. But if you are having something in your mind, you know, knowledge, it's help you until the end of the day. The education is where you, you get your English. Without knowing English, most doors to any type of career or job are closed to you. Now there is free movement. People from other countries, from other nations, they are coming. And the Tanzanian people, they have to move from Tanzania maybe for business, for education. Tourism is, is a huge uh, piece of their economy. They have Kilimanjaro, they have a lot of these safari uh, preserves. Um, you have to be able to speak English. You have to go to school. That's just a little part of a longer video, but hopefully it gives you an idea of what Ed Powerman is doing in Africa. And we're going to support them with our mission project this year in Vacation Bible School. So I hope the kids will come to Vacation Bible School starting next Sunday night at 5 o'clock. And we're going to have a great time, and, and we need some helpers. So... We are ready now to begin our worship. If you'd please rise, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you so much for uh, the blessing of, of the freedoms that we have in this country. And, and on this 4th of July, help us to remember all that you have given us. And, and may we as free people uh, seek to do your will, use our freedom for good. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue now with our confession and forgiveness. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn today is uh, hymn number 890, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory.
Today we're also going to be singing the liturgy for the first time in a long time since the COVID uh, stuff started. We stopped a lot of the singing, and we're going to be singing the liturgy today. And we begin with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. God of the covenant, in our baptism you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us the courage you gave the apostles that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The first lesson today comes from Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 16. Now when Sambalot and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabs and the rest of the enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although at the time I had not set up the doors in the gate, Sambalot and Geshem sent to me saying, 
come and let us meet together at Hakaparim on the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm, and I sent message messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should I work? Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become the king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him saying, no such thing as you say have been done, for you are in inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Now when I went to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Del Deliah and the son of Mehetabel, who was conf conf confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away, that a man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced and the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin, and so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and to the prophetess Nodiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So the wall was finished and on the 21st day of the month of Elu, in 52 days. And when all the enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. The word of the Lord. Let us read the 123rd Psalm responsively. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of the servants who look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid servant the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, till he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us for we have had more than enough contempt. Our, Our soul, soul has had more than enough, enough of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt, contempt of the proud. The second lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse, verses 2 to 10. I know a man in Christ for 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body. I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weakness. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given 
me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that, I, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamity. For when I am weak, I am strong. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for our gospel reading. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel is heard according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Come to you, O Lord. And Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joses, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. This is his hometown of Nazareth. And he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated and we invite the children to come forward for our children's sermon time now. All right, you guys can have a seat there on the red seats. And... uh, yeah, far away from the, the table. That <laughs> hey, guys. Good to see you. Renewing friendships. That's a good thing. Well, I want to ask you guys something. What day is it today? Do you know? It's not the fifth day of July. The 4th of July. All right. What does the 4th of July mean? Do you know? Fireworks. All right. All right. Yeah. You like those. Oh, okay. Well, I have something for you that should tell you something about what this day stands for. Um, Let me give you one of these flags, okay? You can keep this. All right. There you go. Yeah. Oh, you were waving one? Yeah. Well, what, is this, what does this flag stand for? Do you know? America. It does stand for America. Yeah, you were going to say that too. Yeah. And what is it about America that is so special? Do you know? If you think about America, what is, what is one thing that people think of when they think about America? Do you think about, let me, let me suggest something to you. Do you ever think about freedom? Yeah, we have freedom in this country. You guys are growing up. You are. 
And we have a lot of things that we're free to do in this country that are not, people are not free to do in a lot of places in the world. And maybe you haven't realized what a blessing that is yet. What are some of the freedoms you have in this country? That's right. We have the freedom to go where we want to go and live where we want to live and work at jobs we want to work at and, and have the friends we want to have. But you know what, what, what is the most important freedom of all that we have in this country? We have the freedom to worship our God any way that we would like to worship him. We have the freedom here to be in church and worship Jesus today. Did you know that that's not true everywhere in the world? There are some places where they can't have churches and freely worship Jesus because uh, other people will get upset and they won't let them do it. But we have that freedom in this country. And the Bible tells us that, that God has given us this freedom. When God gives us his freedom, he gives it for a very important reason. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us free, not to fall back into the slavery of sin. That's what Paul says in Galatians. God wants us to be free to follow our Lord and to do what he wants us to do in this world. Did you know that? God wants you to be the best person that you can be serving him freely in this world, and he wants you to be good to other people. What are some of the things that you can do to show that, that you love Jesus and you want to serve him in this world? Do you know? What, what can you do? Read the Bible? Yeah, because we want to read his word. We want to know what he says. What are some other things you can do to show how much you love Jesus and want to serve him in this world? Pray. You can pray to him and talk to him. He speaks to us through the Bible and we speak to him in prayer. And another way is we can treat other people the way God wants us to treat them, right? How many of you are always good to your brothers and sisters? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have no sisters. Okay, we don't have to worry about that part. <laughs> you have no sisters either, yeah. But, but God wants us to treat people right, and that starts with treating our family right, and then our friends and people around us in our community. That's one of the freedoms we have, is to be good to other people. Yeah. We are free to be good to other people. All right. We're free to go in the pool today, aren't too, aren't we? That's right. Yes. <laughs> Well, I hope you guys enjoy some freedoms today. Treat each other well, love Jesus, and go in the pool, okay? Well, let's pray. Let's pray, guys. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the freedoms you've given us that we are reminded of on this 4th of July, especially the freedom to serve you and to worship you and to love you and love others as, as you have called us to do. We pray for your strength to help us live out this freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You guys can keep the flag, come up, also get a treat while the people are singing our next hymn, which is My Country Tis of Thee.
Today I continue the sermon series on the book of Nehemiah. This is part five, and I title it, The Plot Against Nehemiah. And I want to read a couple verses from the very end of this text. Uh, Nehemiah writes, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elel in 52 days. And when our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, quite a few years back, my good old Uncle Ole, uh, he got laid off from his factory job and he suddenly found himself out of work. And a few days later, he was looking through the want ads in the local newspaper and saw that the police department in their little Minnesota town was looking for a part-time deputy. So Ole decided to apply for the job. He called the, the police chief, told him he was interested, set up a time to come in and talk with him. And uh, the police chief was interviewing Ole, had him fill out some paperwork, and then he said, now I'm going to ask you three general knowledge questions um, on topics uh, you know, like geography or math or history, just to kind of test your basic competency to see how you think. And Ole says, oh, sounds good to me. So the man asked the first question. He said, what is the capital of Minnesota? And Ole thought for a moment, and then he said, the capital of Minnesota is the letter M. Well, the interviewer thought, well, that's an unusual answer, but it's technically correct. And so he went on to the second question. He said, figure this one out for me. He said, how many seconds are there in a year? And Ole thought for a moment, scratched his head and said, I've got it. There are 12 seconds in a year. And the interviewer said, 12, how do you get 12? And Ole said, well, there's January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd. And he said, okay, I get it, I get it. And again, Ole was technically correct. So he moved on to the third question. He said, can you tell me who shot Abraham Lincoln? Well, Ole thought about that one, and he thought about it, and he thought about it. Um, and the interviewer, uh, the, the police chief, decided to give him break. He, a break. He said, I'll tell you what, why don't you go home and think about that question? Come back here tomorrow with your answer. Ole said, okay, and he, and he headed home. And when he got home, Lena said, how did it go, Ole? Did you get the job? And Ole said, um, well, I think it's a pretty short thing. And Lena says, why do you say that? And he says, well, I just applied for the job today, and they already got me working on a murder case. <laughs> Holy, holy, I don't know. But, well, in our text for this morning, we have our own murder plot to dive into, or should I say attempted murder plot, because unlike the plot against Lincoln, this one would not be successful. And the title of today's sermon is The Plot Against Nehemiah. But before I go into details of that plot, I want to take a couple of minutes to give a brief recap of what has happened so far in the story of Nehemiah. Uh, we've talked about our story began in the year 446 B.C. It was 140 years after the nation of Babylon had destroyed the nation of Judah, destroyed their capital city of Jerusalem, and hauled all of the Jewish people into what it, it came to be known as the Babylonian exile. But just 48 years after that destruction of Jerusalem, in the year 538 B.C., a new empire, the Persian Empire, came in and defeated Babylon and the Persian emperor freed the Jewish people and allowed them to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their nation. But many of, and many of the Jews did go back, but many did not. Many of them stayed in Babylon and enjoyed a good life under the Persian rulers. Well, Nehemiah was a descendant of one of those Jewish families who stayed behind. And when the book of Nehemiah opened in the year 446, he, he had a very important government job. In fact, he was one of the closest advisors to the Persian king at that time, a man by the name of Artaxerxes. But then something happened that changed Nehemiah's life forever. Nehemiah's brother Hananiah had made a trip to the city of Jerusalem, and when he came back, he had a bad report for Nehemiah. He told him, even though the Jews who, who went back to Jerusalem have been back there for about 90 years, they have not yet rebuilt the city walls. In fact, the whole capital city was still in ruins, just like the Babylonians had left it. And that's when Nehemiah felt the call of God. 
And he got permission from the king to travel to Jerusalem and rebuild those walls of Jerusalem and really rebuild the whole nation of Judah. Uh, but when he got there, he soon realized what the real problem was. He soon realized that the surrounding nations, led by a Samaritan governor named Sanballat, were hounding and oppressing and persecuting the Jewish people. Sanballat and his cronies had stolen the Jewish farmland. They had profited from the labor of the Jewish tenant farmers. And the Jews could not fight back because they had no fortress. They had no walled city where they could take refuge and defend themselves. So if they fought the surrounding nations, those nations would roll in and destroy these Jewish peasants. But Nehemiah wanted to change all that. He wanted to rebuild the city walls, give those farmers a place where they could retreat to safety if they were attacked. And he knew if he could rebuild the city walls of Jerusalem, he could rebuild the entire Jewish nation. And that's exactly what Nehemiah did. Over the first four parts of this series, we have seen Nehemiah rally the Jewish people and, and, and begin rebuilding these walls in record time. And all the while that they were rebuilding, they had to defend themselves against attacks from these surrounding nations. But now the goal was in sight. They were almost done. Nehemiah says in chapter 6, verse 1, Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates. So the entire wall is now finished. The only thing left to install is the gates, but those gates are very important. You know, a wall was pretty useless if it had open gates. But how could, how could they stop, uh, uh, you know, how could they, they uh, finish this final piece of the puzzle? That's what the Sam Ballot and all the enemies were thinking about. How can we prevent the Jews from installing those gates? You know, they knew that they could not openly attack during the daytime because if they did, the king of Persia uh, might come down on them hard. He had given Nehemiah permission to build these walls. And if they attacked the, the city openly, they might anger the king. They had already attempted to attack at night using kind of guerrilla-style tactics, but Nehemiah had assigned round-the-clock patrols and had inspired the people to defend their holy city with their very lives if necessary. This weak, fearful collection of dirt farmers had been turned into a fighting force almost overnight. And there was one man who was responsible for that. That one man was Nehemiah. So Sanballat and his evil friends knew that there was only one way that they could stop those gates from being installed and prevent the city from becoming a sealed fortress. There was only one way that they could continue their very profitable oppression of the Jews. They had to kill Nehemiah. That's what they decided. You know, over the years, there have been a lot of uh, conspiracy theories about the assassination of President John Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963. There are a lot of people who don't think Lee R. V. Oswald acted alone. I don't know if those theories are true, but there are some very intriguing facts um, indicating that the mafia, particularly a mob boss by the name of Carlos Marcello, wanted Kennedy dead. And why was that? Well, it was because President Kennedy's younger brother, Bobby Kennedy, had been appointed attorney general and he was hounding the mafia, and in particular, he was hounding Carlos Marcello. In 1976, the U.S. House of Representatives formed a committee to investigate the assassination. And one of the witnesses was a former member of the mob who had become an FBI informant. And he testified that he was present at a mob meeting where Carlos Marcello quoted a Sicilian proverb about how to kill a rooster. The proverb was this, if you want to kill a rooster, you don't cut off the tail, you cut off the head. And everyone in the room knew what he meant. He meant that if they wanted to stop Bobby Kennedy, they were going to have to kill John Kennedy. Well, Sam Ballot and his buddies had come to the same conclusion, and they came up with a plan. They would pretend that they wanted a truce. They would pretend that they wanted to make peace with the Jewish people and they would invite Nehemiah to a meeting in a neutral place. But that meeting would be a trap. Nehemiah says in verse two, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, 
Come and let us meet together at Hakafarim in the plain of Ono. And it sounded like a good spot for a meeting. It was about halfway between Samaria and Jerusalem, and it was just inside Jewish territory, so it was technically in Nehemiah's territory. But it was also an area that was remote enough that they thought they could carry out an assassination and then later claim that they had nothing to do with it. They could claim it was just some bandits who were in that area who had killed Nehemiah. That was the plan. But of course, Nehemiah sniffed it out pretty quickly. He writes, I knew they intended to do me harm. So he sent a very innocent sounding message to Sanballat. He said, I've got this big project that I'm working on. Maybe you've heard about this wall and I can't get away right now. Maybe we can have a barbecue or something after I finish. Yeah. <laughs> well, Sam Ballot didn't like that at all. And he sent four messages to Nehemiah demanding that they sit down and negotiate. And finally, with his fifth letter, he turned up the heat. The fifth letter, it says, was an open letter, meaning he did not seal it with his official seal. Why not? Because he wanted his messenger to read it. He wanted the contents of the letter to leak out. Sam, Sam Ballot was a politician, and leaks were a really important way to get his will done. <laughs> In that open letter, Sam Ballot said, You know, Nehemiah, I've been hearing these rumors, and my friend Geshem has heard them as well. And they, the rumors are that as soon as the wall is finished, you and the Jewish people are going to rebel against the king of Persia. He said, I have also heard that you have a priest and some prophets up there in Jerusalem and that they are going to anoint you and you are going to call yourself the king of the Jews. And, and Sam Ballot said, you know, I don't really believe the rumors, but the rumors are out there. And sooner or later, the king of Persia is going to hear about these rumors and he is going to come down hard on you. And so I think it would be in your best interest to meet with me and talk with me about this so that we can put these rumors to, to rest and make sure the king doesn't get the wrong idea. Now, it was a very serious threat. If Nehemiah did not come to meet with him, then Sanballat would send these rumors on to the Persian king. And what would the Persian king do? Could he afford, afford to ignore a possible rebellion? Would he have Nehemiah arrested? Would he have Nehemiah killed? Nehemiah was in a tough spot. Go to this meeting and quite possibly walk into an assassination plot or refuse to go to the meeting and run the risk of being arrested by the king of Persia. But you see, Nehemiah had an ace in the hole, something that Sanballat knew nothing about. Nehemiah had something that every Christian should strive to have. It is something that you should pray to the Holy Spirit about, that he will give you the strength to attain this very important thing. And here it is. Nehemiah had a good reputation. <laughs> Nehemiah believed that the record of his life and his service in Persia would give him some protection if the false rumors made it to the ears of the king. The king would say, I don't believe that Nehemiah would lead a rebellion against me. I know him too well. You know, in my many years of dealing with young people, I started out in youth ministry and dealt with young people all through the years. And I said to them often, you know, guard your reputation like it's your most important treasure, because it is. There's even a commandment about it, the eighth commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We are commanded by God not to tell a lie about another person, not to spread a rumor about another person, because to lie or, or spread a rumor about another person is to damage their reputation, and to damage their reputation is to damage their soul. Sam Ballot was threatening to damage the, the reputation and the soul of Nehemiah, and he hoped that his threat would lead Nehemiah into his trap. But Nehemiah had the confidence that comes from having a good reputation. And so he sent a note back to Sanballat that said, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. In other words, he said to Sanballat, If it's a battle of reputations that you want, I'll put mine up against yours any day. Well, that got Sanballat's attention. Nehemiah now got into his head. And Sam Ballot started thinking, 
if I go ahead and accuse Nehemiah of rebellion, the king might actually believe Nehemiah and turn his anger on me. And so Sanballat backed down. And Nehemiah prayed. He said, now, O oh God, strengthen my hands to finish this task. But Sanballat had one more trick up his sleeve, one more card that he could play. If Nehemiah, if Nehemiah was protected by his reputation as a man of faith and character, then Sanballat would have to tear down that reputation. You know, when I was serving in one of my previous churches, I went to the grocery store one winter evening to pick up a few things that we needed. I went through the checkout line, had a polite conversation with the cashier. She rang up my items. I handed her cash. She gave me back my change, and I just stuffed that change into my pocket. I grabbed my bags. I went home. But when I got home and I pulled the change out of my pocket, I realized the cashier had given me a dollar too much in change. Now, I didn't really want to go back out into that dark, cold night to that grocery store, and it was only a dollar. But I thought about that young woman who would be closing out her cash drawer that night, coming up a dollar short, and that missing dollar would probably have to come out of her own pocket. So I put on my coat, and I, I drove back to the store. I went to the cashier, and I said, I think you gave me a dollar too much in change. I didn't notice it until I got home. And I handed her the dollar, and she said, Oh, thank you so much, Pastor Shields. She said, After you left, I thought that, that I might have given you too much change, but I figured that if I did, you would bring it back. <laughs> And I was a little stunned. And first of all, I didn't realize she knew who I was. I asked her, have we met before? She said, no, we haven't met, but I know who you are. I have a friend who goes to your church. <laughs> a few weeks later, she showed up in the church with that friend. And I thought to myself, what if I had turned this woman off to the whole idea of church simply because I didn't want to go back out in the cold, you know? Well, Sam Ballot was hoping that he could turn off the Jewish people's faith in Nehemiah if he could just damage his reputation in some way. And he knew just the person who could help him do it. There was a Jewish man in Jerusalem whom the people considered to be a prophet. His name was Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel. That's quite a title. <laughs> and he was the worst kind of a prophet. He was a false prophet. And he was on the payroll of Sanballat. Shemaiah uh, sent a message to Nehemiah asking him to come, please come to my home. He said, I have an urgent prophecy for you from the Lord. He said, I'm too weak to leave my house. And so Nehemiah went to see Shemaiah the prophet. And the, prophet, the prophecy that Shemaiah uh, spoke to him was in Hebrew verse. So it sounded almost like poetry, like something from the Psalms. In English, it goes like this. Let us meet together in the house of the Lord within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. Shemaiah was, was saying to Nehemiah, God wants you to go into the temple and lock the doors and protect yourself because your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. That's what God wants. That's the prophecy. Well, when Nehemiah heard that prophecy, he was puzzled because something didn't sound right. In the previous section of chapter 6, Nehemiah was saved from the threats of Sanballat because he had a good reputation. In this section, he's going to be saved because he has a good sense of right and wrong, or sometimes we call it having a sharp conscience. Two things jumped out at Nehemiah in this prophecy. First of all, Nehemiah said, should such a man as I run away? Now here he had been urging the people to be courageous, to stand and fight for their homes and families. How would it look now if at the first sign of personal danger he ran and hid in the temple? And then secondly he said to Shemaiah, and what man such as I could go into the temple and live? Nehemiah knew his scriptures. He knew that God had said, no one shall go into the temple except for the priests who are performing their priestly duties. No one else. So Nehemiah was saying, if I go in the temple, God might even strike me down. And even if God does not strike me down, the fact that he went in there would cause all of the God-fearing Jews, the ones he needed to have on his side, to turn against him. He would look like a hypocrite. So Nehemiah said to Shemaiah, I will not go in. 
And then he adds this commentary to the story. He says, for I understood and I saw that God had not sent Shemaiah, but that he had pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin, and so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Nehemiah's sharp conscience, his inward sense of what was right and wrong, had saved him from the staining of his reputation. And people, that inward sense comes only from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If you have faith, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then the Holy Spirit is already living inside of you, living in your heart. And he is your conscience. And if you are faced with a situation where you are tempted to do something that is not in line with the will of God, you will feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And if you ignore that prompting, you ignore it at your peril. It is my firm belief that whenever a Christian is tempted to do something that will bring harm to his, his or her reputation or bring dishonor to God, there is always that moment of clarity from the Holy Spirit. There's always that moment when you know, without a doubt, that you are about to do something or say something that is wrong. So pay attention to the Holy Spirit in those moments of clarity and save yourself from a lot of heartache and embarrassment. Nehemiah defeated the plots that were hatched against him. He defeated them by having a good reputation and by having a good sense of right and wrong, a sense from the Holy Spirit that he did not ignore. And what was the end result? Nehemiah writes, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. Nehemiah had accomplished in 52 days what no other Jewish leader had been able to accomplish in 90 years. Think about that. The people of the surrounding nations sure thought about that. Nehemiah writes that they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. So Nehemiah has built his wall, and with that wall he has built a city. And next week we will see if he can also build a community to live in that city out of this ragtag bunch of exiles. And I have a feeling that he can do it because he is God's faithful servant. So we'll look at that next week. Amen and amen. Please rise. And we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated, and we sing the hymn number 790, Day by Day.
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the freedoms you have given us in this nation. And we pray that we might use those freedoms to do your will in the world. Help us to uh, seek to live according to your will so that there is no uh, cause for those who are unbelievers, those who are outside the church to, to, uh, to uh, give, uh, say things about the church because of the way we act. Protect our reputations and strengthen them. And Father, we do pray that you live in each one of our hearts. We know the Holy Spirit is with us when we have faith, when we trust in you. And so we pray that, that our consciences will be sharp, that the Holy Spirit will protect us from making those decisions that, uh, that might harm us and that we might listen to those promptings from the Spirit and be guided by that. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for all those who are celebrating occasions this week, weddings and anniversaries and birthdays and baptisms. Thank you for birthdays this week being celebrated by Dwayne Smith and Gay Kyle, by Jennifer Jaquis and Lindsay Kauser, by Kristen Johnson and by Harlan Olson celebrating his first birthday. Bless all of these celebrations, Lord, in your mercy. Father, we lift up those who uh, are in need. We think of uh, the family of Tommy Larson as we said goodbye to him in this world uh, this past week. We, we thank you for the joy that he brought to so many. We pray for those who are dealing with cancer, uh, Kim Darrow and Marvin Hartz, Jeanette Dunn and Matt Scruggs, Matt's mother Susan, Anna Meyer, and others that, that we name in our hearts. We also lift up Lonnie Swinford and pray for her continued recovery from her stroke, that she may be home soon. We pray for Pat Anderson and her lung issues, for Ray Chamberlain Jr. as he recovers from a difficult back surgery. We continue to pray for John Purvis and Kate Newby and Mary Hull and Sarah Himes. And thank you so much that Sarah has now been able to return home. Bless all of these people, Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we pray for our Vacation Bible School, which will start next Sunday. We ask that you would bless the time that we'll have together with those young people. And we pray that, um, that, that we will have enough people that will step up and, and be able to, to help lead at, at Bible School so that we can do this very important work of passing on the faith to our children. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to now bring communion out to you. If you would hold on to um, the little cup and wafer until we all have received it and we'll receive communion together.
I like using that communion hymn in July because it feels like Christmas, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> you sing that. Well, let us all take the wafer. And this is the body of Christ given for you. Receive the body of our Lord. And then open the cup, the second layer. This is the blood of Christ shed for your sin. Receive the blood of our Lord. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And now receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And please rise now. We're going to close by singing the hymn, America the Beautiful. Beautiful for spacious skies. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.